Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Conrad Bobulak, and I'm really excited tonight about this webinar, which is on how to conduct investment property due diligence and research, and essentially how to identify the best performing suburbs, and then zo really zoom in, in within those suburbs into streets, and then find the best performing properties in terms of whether you should be buying a townhouse, an apartment, or a house of land in that area. I'm also going to release three new projects, um, which is very exciting. So as you know, if you know my background, <clears throat> I run Investors Prime Real Estate. My name is Conrad Bobby Lake, by the way. And I source projects all the time for my private clients. So I've just sourced three new projects, which I'm about to show you, which is really cool. Um, and also at the end, I'm going to take a lot of questions about anything that was covered throughout this webinar. I'm also going to give you a bit of a market update where we are in the current property cycle. Uh, in terms of Australia and also where we're going in the future and I think more importantly when is the best time to get in and make money. So there's a lot to cover uh, and I'm really excited about uh, tonight. I just want to do a bit of a sound check to make sure that you guys can hear me. So if everyone can just say yes, you can hear you and see my screen before we get started. Can you guys hear me and see me? Not see me, but uh, hear me? Excellent. Okay, company disclaimer. Everything that I'm showing you is educational purposes only. I haven't considered your situation. Seek professional advice. Personal disclaimer. I'm not going to basically tell you that if you do this, you're going to become wealthy. My results are not typical. I'm not going to insult your intelligence by promising you are implying you're going to build a multi-million dollar property portfolio like I have. But what I'm going to do tonight is share with you what's worked for me over the last 10, 15 years and give you some pointers and insight into some of the decision-making models that I use when it comes to choosing property, when it comes to cash analysis, when it comes to due diligence. And ultimately, my objective tonight during this webinar is for your awareness to go up so you can ask better, better quality questions and become more intelligent as an investor. So really the ultimate goal tonight is just to empower you so you can make more money in real estate and enjoy it. Now there's actually four things that I want to cover, um, a bit of psychology at the beginning, but four things that are key for you to become successful in building a large property portfolio. The first thing you've got to have is the right psychology and the mindset. You know, 80% of success is psychology, 20% is specialized knowledge. Now, tonight I'm going to focus purely on the 20% specialized knowledge, the things that you've got to do. But psychology and the mindset uh, is the stuff that makes you do what you should do. You know, it's the difference between psychology, uh, the right psychology and the wrong psychology is how many people listening to the webinar tonight um, know that to become, to lose body fat, you've got to go to the gym. But how many of us actually do it? <laughs> right? So psychology is the difference when you're going to the gym five days a week and eating right or eating ice cream sitting on the couch and watching, you know, the biggest biggest loser on TV. So that's the difference with psychology. Psychology is everything. Then you've got to have the right plan, the right system. And everyone on this webinar will have a completely different situation. Some of you will be young, starting out investing in property. Some of you will be, you know, 40, 50 at the peak of your career, some of you will be close to retiring. So obviously there is no one right plan for everyone. And that's why it's important to develop a plan that's personalized, that takes into consideration your level of skills and knowledge, the amount of time that you have, the money that you have, and your risk profile as an investor. How many properties you're comfortable buying, for how much, how much buffer you want to build into your plan. Then number three, you've got to have a team of experts around you. Without your team of experts, it's going to be very difficult for you to build large wealth through property. Who are the experts? I'm talking, of course, about, number one, your mortgage broker or your banker or your, or your finance strategist. Number two, your solicitor. Number three, your accountant, your financial planner, your real estate agent or property expert, etc. So developing access to a team around you of experts is really, is literally 25% of your success. Because if you've got the right psychology and you develop the right plan, but then you haven't got the team that can implement that plan, then you won't get far in investing. The final thing is you've got to have the right property selection methodology. You've got to be, you've got to have the right level of 
awareness and information that enables you to discern between good properties and bad properties. And that's what tonight's webinar is all about. I'm going to empower you with some key points, some key distinctions that will enable you to discern between good properties, bad properties, good areas and bad areas. I'm going to name areas in Melbourne that you should completely never invest in and I'm going to show you the top best 15 suburbs in Melbourne for the last you know, 20 years. So it's not just about giving you general information and getting you excited. I'm going to go into specifics and especially towards the end when I'm doing cash flow analysis, I'm going to pick apart specific properties um, and I'm going to do extreme cash flow analysis to show you how much it costs in dollars and cents per week to hold on to these properties. So everything about this webinar tonight, it's very tangible, it's very informative, very educational. I'd be excited about that because I certainly am. Now, this bonus section, as I mentioned before, there's three projects that I've just sourced. One in Brighton, which is one of the best developments I've ever sourced. Mordialic townhouses and Chelsea townhouses, 30 metres from the beach. So I'm going to go through those at the end as well and show you a little bit about each project, what's good and bad about each project. Not every project's perfect, but I'm going to show you why I've sourced them and explain to you a little bit about the advantages of buying into some of these and the disadvantages of buying into some of these. Because once again, there is no one perfect property and that's why you've got to look at property objectively and make up the decision whether it's something that you want to do or it's something that you don't want to do. Remember, property are like buses. You miss one, there's another one around the corner. <clears throat> there's never going to be a shortage of properties in Melbourne. They're always coming on the market. So once again, going back to the original point, this is what I deem as my definition of success when it comes to property investing. You can see the middle part. You've got to have all these four things synchronized if you want to become successful in property investing. And I'm assuming I'm assuming you are interested seeing that you're watching this webinar right now. So you've got to have the right psychology with the right plan, with the right experts, and then choose the right properties. If any one of these is dysfunctional, think about your own specific situation. You've got no chance of, of becoming successful. You see, you imagine you've got the right psychology. You get it. You know you've got to invest in property. You know the government's not going to be there to support you when you retire, etc. Then you get the right plan done. Okay, even with a financial planner, you get a statement of advice, full plan. Now even if you've got the right experts, the right accountant, the right mortgage broker, the right solicitor, imagine you chose the worst properties to invest in, Dockland, South Bank, Gold Coast. It's not going to work, you know, so property selection is, is important. Now, let's take another approach. Wrong psychology, okay? You have a fear of debt. You don't understand mortgages. You actually are repelled by any kind of notion of taking on, on the mortgage. Now, think about it. Every time you buy a property, you're taking a mortgage. So psychology is all wrong. You don't understand the advantages of leveraging other people's money to become wealthy, which is what the rich have been doing for decades. You got the best plan, the best experts, best property selection and strategy, guess what? Nothing happens because you don't implement. So you see, if any one of these circles, these this 25 percentiles fails you, the whole thing collapses and doesn't work. That's why it's so important to have these four things synchronized, working together, and that, that's the definition of success when it comes to property investing. So for those of you who don't know who I am, why should you listen to me? I won't bore you to death with my background and credentials, but I am a real estate agent, ex-mortgage broker, ex-banker. Um, I've actually spent all my career in financial planning, residential lending, commercial lending, asset finance. I worked for NAB. Um, I've worked for Medfin as a financier. I had a mortgage broking company with 10 full-time mortgage brokers. At the peak, I had 13 actually, plus staff, and I had a real estate company with nine full-time selling agents. I'm also a property investor, which is probably the most important part of all of this. I'm semi-retired, and I'm an author of a book called Australian Property Finds Made Simple, which is out now for $32.95. Probably get it on eBay for 10 bucks. <laughs> so you can jump on bookonfinance.com.au if you'd like to buy that book, or on amazon.com.au. It's a bit of a plug for my book. <clears throat> now. Let's talk about the Australian property market, September 2015. Interesting, we've hit the $6 trillion level in value of residential property. Now, just to put that into perspective, the combined value of the Australian superannuation funds is $2 trillion. The Australian Stock Exchange is worth $1.5 trillion. Interesting, 25% of the residential property market and the value of commercial real estate is $0.7 trillion. And this is the reason why I like investing in residential real estate. It's the biggest thing that you can invest in in Australia, full stop. And the whole economy is underwritten by it. 
the banking system is underwritten by it, and we hold majority of our wealth in it. So we don't hold majority of our wealth in listed equities. We hold it in real estate. The private sector data from the Reserve Bank indicates that the total value of outstanding mortgage debt is around 1.5 trillion as of June 2015. So the LVR on the whole residential property market is only 25% LVR. So 1.5 trillion in mortgages, 6 trillion in value. Now the other interesting thing is, and this is why I don't believe personally the market's going to collapse and or have a correction of any significant amount. That 1.5 trillion in mortgages isn't equally spread across suburbs. The interesting thing is that the most expensive suburbs in Australia, so in Melbourne and Sydney, the most expensive suburbs are virtually all paid off. Majority of the debt is held in the fringe suburbs where people are getting into brand new, you know, four bedroom, two bathroom homes and borrowing 95%. So the, the, the blue chip areas of Australian major capital cities virtually have no debts. Most of those properties are paid off, which is why they are so resilient. And we saw this during the GFC. And I've done other webinars to show you the difference between the Australian market and the US market and why nothing happened here during the GFC. But I thought I'd mention that because that is, that is a huge thing to go to $6 trillion, which just occurred recently. If you look what's happening currently in terms of the Australian property market values, the last property boom we really had was 2001, 2003. And we had a boom where there was a high volume of listings on the market. We had the very high capital growth, 20% plus, as you can see there. Um, and we had people paying ridiculous prices for properties. Um, since then, we haven't really had a boom. We had a bit of a peak in 2007 and 2010. And, you know, but it hasn't been the same because the main difference is the volume of properties being listed is record low. We haven't seen the volume of properties listed that we have seen in the last property cycle. I think we're probably two or three years away from the largest boom we've seen for a while. That's my gut feeling. Don't hold me against it. Uh, if you look at the annual change in capital growth values to July 2015, you can see there Melbourne, Sydney's done 16%, Melbourne's done 11%. You know, Brisbane is just starting to kick in. It's around about it's 8 o'clock on the property clock, so it's behind Sydney and Melbourne. But remember, the market is very cyclical, and Sydney always goes first, then Melbourne, then Brisbane. <clears throat> um, the thing is that not all suburbs are made equal. You know, So even though Melbourne has done 11%, some suburbs have done 5%, some suburbs have done 20% in Melbourne. So the question is, can you identify those suburbs? And I'm going to show you those suburbs that you should be targeting and those that you should be avoiding at all costs. So if we look at the, the Melbourne property market, very similar story, the Melbourne property market virtually mirrors the Australian property market. If you look at the median prices in Melbourne in July 2015, houses have a median price of 630,000, units have a median price of 483,500. You can see there over 12 months uh, in terms of growth, houses have grown by 12.3%, units have grown by 4.8%. Why have apartments grown slower than houses at 4.8? Because when they work out the data, they, they take into consideration all the stock, including Dockland, South Bank, inner city stock. So if you extrapolate that data and you, and you expand on it more, and you take away all the bad developments, you end up with around 8% for, for apartments in the best areas. So I'm talking about areas located in the Bayside boutique apartments. Yeah, if you look at apartments that have 200 apartments in them, built by you know, developers sold overseas, obviously you're going to get a lower return. In fact, a lot of apartments go backwards. You know, I've, I, you've probably seen other webinars where I've shown you apartments. In Docklands and South Bank, when people have paid $550 for a two-bedroom apartment 10 years ago, and they sold it last year for $550, they've actually made a loss on not only on stamp duty and legals and agents' fees, but in real terms, you know, they've made nothing and inflation has been growing at 3.75%. So it's very interesting. Um, if you look at the average held for a number of years, 11.8 for houses. People are holding on to houses a lot longer. Uh, units, 9.7. And the other interesting thing is, if you look at the rental yields on houses, 3% and on units, 4.1. In fact, the, the departments that I target usually have a rental yield between 4 to 4.5%. So cheaper to hold on to, as long as you choose the right department in the right area. Um, but obviously, houses are the way to go um, because they're the most preferred method of, of, of 
investing and living in Australia. That's what we've been conditioned as a nation to live in, houses. So that's very interesting data. One thing that's happening with, with um, the average person is they're holding onto their house for a lot longer than used to. I mean, 10 years ago, the average house sold every seven years. Now it's 11.8. Why? Because people can't sell an upgrade. There's no point selling something and be priced out of the suburb that you want to move into. So people are holding on a lot longer, waiting for the money to double, even triple, before they can buy the house they really want. And that's what's going to happen longer and longer. You're going to see a, a trend in the future where people will be holding onto houses for 15 years and eventually 20 years, um, and especially in, in blue chip areas. In fact, if you look at the top, top suburbs in Melbourne and Sydney, a lot of these houses sometimes come up on the market once every 50 to 100 years. And that's going to be the trend in a lot of these, these areas, which is really interesting. Here's the key thing to take away from all of this. Let's look at the herd mentality. Let's look at investors. The first thing to understand is that during the bottom of the market, which was during the GFC, that's when the smart money comes in and they buy everything. And this is where developers come in. This is where <coughs> savvy investors come in. And this is called the stealth phase. And they just buy everything in sight that matches their methodology and selection criteria because that never changes. You know, my criteria hasn't changed for, for well over a decade. I don't care what happens in the market. The same properties, I target the same stock that I've always targeted. Eventually, as the market goes up and as we go around the property clock and we pass 6 o'clock being the bottom of the cycle going up to 7 and 8, the awareness phase kicks in and the institutional investors wake up and they suddenly start buying properties um, and putting them into unlisted and listed property trusts. The mania phase is what's happening now you know, where everyone's going in, the public has knows the market's going up, they don't believe it's going to crash, they haven't bought into the bubble myth. It's going to go up with or without them. That's the general consensus right now in the market phase. Um, is it a good time to buy right now? No. You know, on the one hand, it's, it's always a good time to buy. The best time to buy was yesterday. But is it the best time to buy in the property cycle? Well, definitely not because we're currently, um, you know, at 10 o'clock on the property clock. So, you know, is it the best time to buy? No, the best time to buy is at the bottom of the market when everyone everyone is you know depressed, <laughs> losing money. Eventually what happens is the market hits a peak, which no one really knows when that will be, but I'll show you a good indicator to measure this in. And then suddenly people buy at the peak because they, they have a fear of missing out, uh, which is FOMO. Um, because fear of missing out FOMO, which is a condition now, which uh, of people just fear of missing out, Eventually, it turns into um, GOMO, the grief over missing out, where people become depressed because they go to 15 auctions and they can't get into the market um, because they just keep losing out on, on other, other bidders. Eventually, people just pay whatever it takes. They overpay and the market has the market stalls, runs out of steam like everything else in this world. And then people hold on and they, and they go into this stage of denial. Wow, it's just a small correction. It's going to happen. It's going to return to normality. And eventually keeps plummeting, and you hear stories how people, you know, houses they've paid a hundred, you know, seven hundred thousand are worth six hundred thousand. The fear eventually turns to despair, and people sell. The average, the average buyer that buys a property and sells that property within five years loses money on that property, and then the cycle starts over again. If you look at the median prices in Melbourne, for example, nineteen sixty-six, the average house. Well, the median price, I should say, was $13,000, 76, 37,000, 86, 83,000, 96, 144,000, uh, 2008, 432,500, and 2014, 607, and right now 630, which is interesting. So where are we in the property cycle? Well, that's where Melbourne is currently in the property cycle, around 10 o'clock on the property clock. Now, when I show you this, um, and I encourage you guys to question all the stats, question everything. You know, don't take anything at face value. Because, you know, when I show you the property clocks, I, you know, do you think I just sit around at home and do nothing to do and make up the property clock? Who do I go to to get this information? Well, I go to Heron Todd White Valuers, which are the biggest valuation company in Australia. And that's the website um, that I want you guys to go to. And I want you to download the monthly review report, which is a free document, around 30 pages that you can read and gives you a really detailed synopsis of the property market um, as it is currently right now. It's a month by month summary. So if you ever want to go to sleep really quickly, read this, you'll be out in half an hour. 
I love it. And this is the latest property clock, the national property clock, according to Heron Todd White Valuers, September 2015. And you can see there, Melbourne is around about 10 o'clock on the property clock. 12 o'clock being the peak of the market. So we've probably got another couple of years of, of good growth and then you're going to be at the peak. So the thing is this, is it a good time to buy? Yeah, because if you buy today in Melbourne in the right area, okay, you're going to make money for the next two years, providing that everything stays con constant and you've bought in the right area for the right price. Um, is it the best time to buy? No, probably four years ago was, was a better time to buy because you would have been at the bottom of the market. That's the reality of the market. Now, th there's a couple of things. First of all, Heron told white valuers don't sell anything apart from valuations. They're independent valuers. They're on the panel of all lenders in Australia and they have a vest vested interest, not in what the market goes up, down or sideways. The most important thing to these guys is they get it right because their reputation is on the line every single time they print this documentation. Now remember, valuers are the best people for getting information, accurate information about the property market. As a real estate agent myself, these is some the information that I, that I follow, and especially from valuers, because they're independent, they don't sell anything, they've got no vested interest whether the market goes up, down or sideways. So whenever you're getting advice from someone, always ask yourself this question, is the person qualified, number one? So who are they? Not just some journalist, you know, telling you the, the market's crashing. Number two, if they're telling you something, what is the vested interest? What's the outcome? What are they selling you on the back of that information? Because really, Heron Todd White doesn't sell anything. It's just, they're just valuers. So which areas to target in Melbourne? Well, a couple of interesting things about Melbourne. Melbourne is one of the, has one of the biggest urban sprawls in the world as a city. I mean, it's growing out of control. We've got 96,000 people moving to Melbourne every single um, yeah, so it's, a, it's got huge, huge capital growth. So, you know, a lot of these people now are moving in with a lot of cash. And this is the thing that's interesting. When you have 1,500 people, you know, to 2,000 people moving to a city every week, obviously the city cannot accommodate that kind of growth and that many properties. And this was very apparent to to the council and the state government um, and, and the respective uh, councils. So what they did was they went out and, and they studied two cities which took the opposite stand on their, on their urban growth. One of them was Los Angeles where they just allow infinite urban sprawl in all directions. And the other one was the opposite of that was London where they capped the urban growth boundaries and stopped areas or land being rezoned from rural to residential. And they look at both and look at Los Angeles, what happened was that there was a lot of ghettos created in Los Angeles, a lot of areas that were socially, I guess, disadvantaged where you had third and fourth generation long-term unemployed people, you know, creating a whole new generation of unemployed people and crime, etc. And then you had you know, London, where if you've ever been to London, if you drive out of the city, suddenly you're in regional London. You know, there's like acreages and you can't build anything. So what they did was they capped the Melbourne urban growth corridors or the urban growth boundaries, which is the line that you can see there in Melbourne, which is the, um, um, the grey line. The dark grey sections, which are so-called growth corridors, represent land that's been already secured by a number of developers. Um, that's going to be released in the next 25 years. So the worst areas you can invest in to make money are the growth corridors in Melbourne, the new house and land estates. Why? Because there's infinite supply of stock and no demand for that stock. So the next 25 years, so put it this way, if I went to Metricon or Burbank or Simmons and said, listen, I've got a thousand contracts here for a thousand brand new homes in Trigonina or Tarnit or Roxborough Park or South Morang or Pakenham or Berwick, can you get me can you get me a thousand brand new homes? Guess what they'll say? Absolutely. If I went to all the real estate agents in Elwood and I said I've got a thousand contracts here to buy houses in Elwood, um, can you provide me that stock? They would say, well there's only 14 houses at the moment listed, so you've got to get in line. And that's the reality of what creates growth. It's limited supply with the right demographic that has the ability to pay above market. So should I invest in house land estates around Melbourne? If you are going to, do it very carefully. I'm going to show you some stats in a second uh, and what happens. So which, are, which areas to avoid in Melbourne? Well, this is one of the things that I look for. There's a lot of different areas to avoid, but 
This is a report that came out um, which was created by the government um, and this is on Victoria's worst struggling towns revealed, dropping off the edge report. And this is a photo of a trashed house in Corio, um, rated one of Victoria's most disadvantaged postcodes and here someone wrote, have fun. Um, so Victoria's, uh, Victoria's worst struggle towns revealed in the dropping off the edge report reveals that, that there's only a few locations that cluster these kind of um, people in these postcodes. And literally, when you have a property, the last thing you want to do is have the property trashed. But the other thing you, you want to do is when you're buying a house or an apartment or a townhouse, what creates capital growth are, are two things. Number one is scarcity of stock and the most important thing is household incomes have to be high. So people with money who have the ability to pay, pay above market, not people with no money who have no ability to pay above market. These are the most disadvantaged postcodes in Victoria or in Melbourne. And you've got all the, you know, the usual suspects, Broadmeadows, Corio, Frankston North, you know, Morwell, Braybrook, um, you know, <laughs> Mowey, St Albans. So these are the areas that while they can, they're okay to live in and you might want to do subdivisions in these areas because they're cheap, it's not a good area to buy and hold to make money in terms of capital growth. So in the red there you've got the most disadvantaged postcodes um, and in the green you've got the most advantaged postcodes or in the blue. So guess which areas I target when it comes to investing? People with money or people with no money? Have a think about it for a second. These red areas happen to include the growth corridors. It's literally an overlapping effect. So where are the best areas to target in Melbourne? If you look at the highest capital growth, 2001-2011, Q had 366% in growth. Q median price went from 417,500 to 1 1.9 million. Now it's around, you know, 2.5, 2.6 million. Malvern East, Ivanhoe, Baldwin, Canterbury, Hawthorne, Hawthorne East. You know, it's the same. It's the same areas. Glen Waverley. Look what's happening in Glen Waverley now with the Chinese buying up Glen Waverley. I mean, there's three million dollar houses being sold. There. It's ridiculous. In fact, in Q. Q rose $200,000 every year for the past 25 years and it's not, it's not even, it's not stopping. You know, there's more and more people that want to live there with money and more people willing to pay above market and they have the ability to pay above market. People always say, well, who's going to pay $3 million for these houses? I don't know, people that are worth $10 million? And there's plenty of people that are worth $10 million out there. You know, there's, there's, there's thousands of millionaires in China that want to live in Australia. There's thousands of millionaires everywhere around the world that want to live in Melbourne, which is the most livable city in the world four years in a row. So who wants to live in these areas? Wealthy people have got the money to do so. So even though you might not be able to afford as an investment property to buy a $303 million house, it's not even worth buying that as an investment, can you buy a townhouse or apartment in those areas? And the answer is yes which I'm about to show you. Walk score is another way that I would target and look at uh, Melbourne. Walk score is a measure of the walkability factor of a suburb to transport um, infrastructure, schools, etc. If you look at the top growth suburbs for Melbourne for units 2004-2014, you've got Altona, Murrumbina, Malvern, West Footscray, Ashburton, Gardenvale, Forest Hill, Bot. Box Hill, Eaglemont, Brooklyn. Um, these are the top suburbs for units. If you look for houses, for example, the same prop, you know, same suburbs as always. Baldwin, um, you know, Mount Albert, Middle Park, Baldwin North, Chatston, Travancore, Q, Mount Albert, Glen Waverley. So, if you look at a, you know, if you look at the 316 suburbs that exist in Melbourne, this is the way I look at it. Where are the areas that have the highest income in Melbourne? Where are the areas where, where it's harder to get into than ever before, there's restricted supply and there's high income? And if you look at the dark blue sections of Melbourne, you need to have at least 150 to 200,000 per household required to buy a property in that particular postcode. So the dark blue areas in Melbourne are the best areas to target for different reasons. And I can't go into all the reasons, but, but schools obviously is a big one. Um, you know, restricted supply, demographics, transport, shopping, trans, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and if you look at the change in 2001, 2011, what's happening in Melbourne, like in Sydney, there is a massive distinction and fragmentation of the market 
from suburbs that are expensive to suburbs that are mega expensive. So if you look at seriously unaffordable, the dark blue section, Melbourne is becoming seriously unaffordable. I believe Melbourne is undervalued, especially the Bayside. I reckon the Bayside is dirt cheap. You know, people say, well, it's so expensive. I say, compared to what? We're the number one city in the world. What are you comparing it to? London, New York? Check out the price, prices in Manhattan, New York. You know, people are paying $100 million for apartments in New York. But people say, well, that's New York. But what is Melbourne? Melbourne's number one city in the world. I mean, you know, think about it in terms of perspective because we, we're always saying it's very expensive. But compared to what? What are we comparing it to? We're number one in the world. I think Melbourne and Sydney, Darling Harbour in, in, in Sydney and the eastern suburbs and Melbourne Bayside is dirt cheap. And I think it's going to have, because now it's on the international radar and it's an it's amazing country to live in, I think you're going to see prices that are, that are just stupid being paid for properties. I mean, Sydney, you're already seeing 30, 40, 50 million dollar houses. You're going to be seeing that in Melbourne. You're going to be seeing ridiculous prices being paid and it's just going to continue on and on because really what is there, what else can you buy, you know, in, in terms of properties and what are you comparing it to? So to me, it's just a matter of how, to, as an investor, how can you get a slice of the action? That's really the number one question. If you look at schools, schools are very important. You know, if you look at Melbourne, Victoria's top schools, uh, you look at the top, you know, the top 10, guess where they're located? Bayside and the eastern suburbs. You know, it's the same in Sydney. Where are the top schools? Eastern suburbs, you know. So that's the areas you want to be targeting for, for properties. Now, walk score is very important. Walk score walk, it ranks the walkability factor from your suburb and the ability to walk out of your house on an apartment or a townhouse and access transport, infrastructure, schools, restaurants, coffee. So the, the green dots here represent the highest walk score, the red, the lowest walk score. Now, this isn't just um, this is just one of the filters that I use as an investor. So, for example, in Melbourne, the highest ranking suburb was South Yarra with a walk score of nearly 100. The lowest was Hallam. Where in Hallam, you know, in South Yarra, you walk out of an apartment, um, you know, within 10 minutes, within five minutes, you're in front of over 100 places you can eat or have a coffee. In Hallam, within five minutes of walking from your house, you're in front of someone else's house. Now, you could knock on the door and ask for a coffee, but I don't think you're going to be <laughs> liking what the answer would be. So if you look at the highest walk school suburbs in Melbourne out of 100, you, it's Carlton, 97, Victoria, Victoria North, 93, Melbourne, 93, St Kilda, South Yarra, East Melbourne, South Melbourne, Collingwood, Windsor. Look at the lowest walk school suburbs in Melbourne. Croydon North, Liddale, Endeavour Hills, Atwood, Mount Elvin, Rosebud West, Roxborough Park, Belgrave, Nary Warren, Durham. Now, the question you have to ask yourself, is there a correlation between walk school and the median price of suburbs? And yes, there is. If you look at the most expensive suburbs in Melbourne, you know, Turak, 2.26 million, walk school, 74. Dippendy, 75, walk school, 1.9 million. Kuyong, East Melbourne, you know, Canterbury, Middle Park, Brighton. You know, Brighton is probably the most second the most expensive suburb, depending on the week in, in Melbourne, 75. Malvern, Armadale, St Kilda West. Have a look at the lowest walk scores and the median price. Frankston North, 38, 247,000. Dallas, Coolaroo, Jakarta, Werribee. Dufton, you know, Cranbourne, Broadmeadows, $300,000 median prices. So the thing is, you've got to look at walk score. Will people pay a premium? It's so logical, isn't it? <laughs> I can't even believe I'm going to say this. Let me ask you a question. Do you think people are going to pay more money to live in an area with the best schools, transport, and lots of restaurants? Or B, are people going to pay lots of money in an area where there is no schools, no transport, no restaurants? You know, it's just, it's logical, isn't it? So as an investor, you know, you've got to be aware of the walk score and you've got to be aware of the suburbs that have the highest walk score because the likelihood is they're going to have the highest consistent capital growth. Now, you can live wherever you want to live, but I'm talking about investing. I'm not talking about living, you know, for lifestyle. And once again, if you look at the top suburbs in Melbourne in terms of performance, they tend to have the highest walk score or walk scores higher than 70. So they're very conveniently located and equipped with all the things that people want to have in the suburb. Walk school is very consistent with the value general's office as well. If you look at the red area, that area has appreciated faster than any other part of Melbourne. Guess where I source all my projects and guess where personally as an investor I have all my properties? You guess that it's in the red section. So what factors really determine and drive property prices? And this is something I'm giving you information guys here that took me you know, 10, 15 years to understand. 
Location, location, location doesn't determine capital growth. That's something that agents tell you to, you know, when they want to sell your property. Scarcity combined with high demand by the right demographics determine high capital growth. So you've got to have scarcity. You've got to have areas that have heritage protection, density restrictions, height restrictions. And then you've got to have the right demographics, the right households with the right income who have the ability and willingness to pay above market. And, and then you've got to high, have high demand. You've got to have areas. What's high demand? Why is an area have high demand? Because more people want to live in the area because there's more stuff there to do and access. And that's a definition of capital growth. Because you're going to get capital growth just based on inflation, which is 3.5%, and bureaucracy of creating land and getting a site rezoned, redeveloped. But what you want is you want that demand. You want more people. You want 10 people fighting over one property, like in, in those top suburbs, which is why they have auctions, than in suburbs where there's a 1,000 houses on the market any, any week and no one wants them, because that is a definition of low capital growth. Now, I've actually developed a 42-point due diligence criteria, which I'm going to be including in my next book, which will hopefully be coming out next year, called Australian Property Due Diligence and Research Made Simple. And I want to share with you some of the key, key um, due diligence things that, I, I guess, criteria that I look for when I'm buying property. So number one is income demographics. I look for properties where there's people with lots of money living in suburbs and I want to move. Number two, I look for historical capital growth of 10% plus for the last 20 years, on, according to RP data. Uh, then I look for proximity of the project to city and water. You know, Melbourne and Sydney is literally, you know, valued by the distance, the city distance to water. Then you want to have the ability of transport and freeway infrastructure in the area. How quickly can you get to the city and the water? Then you've got to have the right primary schools and secondary schools in the area. How prestigious are the schools? And then I look at things like vacancy rates and rental demand, um, the volume of stock being offered in the area by the developers, the volume of stock coming onto the market in the area, and then the housing strategy of the council for the area. The areas that I target where, is the, where the councils are completely hostile to developers, where they hate developers, they've, they've got you know, heritage protection on blocks, height restrictions, density restrictions, single dwellings, covenants or restricted footprint, you know, um, dwellings on properties. Like, for example, a lot of the Bayside area in Melbourne, for an average townhouse now, you've got to have 400 square metres of land, you know. So that's changing the volume of stock that's coming on the market. If you look at the micro-level factors, I look at the cost per square metre of, of selling stock in the area. As an investor, you've got to know in a suburb exactly what stock is selling for so, for example, in Melbourne, in St Kilda, St Kilda is selling right now at around 9,000 per square metre. So that means a, you know, 50 square metre apartment is selling for $400,000. Um, but there's some apartments in St Kilda that have hit, you know, 10,000 and up to 11,000. you got to then look at the size of the property, number of bedrooms, and the size of the development. You know, I tend to target boutique developments, never target anything over 50 because it automatically gets um, deemed high density by valuers. Then you've got to look at the layout configuration of the property, the floor plan, the level and quality of fixtures and fittings throughout the property. Now, when I'm going through the three new projects, I'll be going through some of these points to give you a bit more education about what I look for as an investor. And then you've got to look at the builders and developers' experience and track record. Can they deliver the product, especially if you're buying off the plan? Because, you know, there's a risk factor of buying something based on looking at pretty brochures, but can I deliver the end product? So all the developers and builders that I deal with as an investor and through real estate um, and through my real estate companies, I deal with people that have been delivering stuff for the last 10, 20, even 30 years. They've got a proven track record. So what type of properties to target in Melbourne? How's... Townhouses are the best properties to target in Melbourne. Three-bedroom townhouses located in established areas are your number one vehicle for building wealth because they're brand new, so you've got massive depreciation, massive tax deductions, no structural problems. You essentially have a three-bedroom house in a suburb that's established, and hopefully you pick the best suburb, without a backyard because really you can't afford to buy, buy a house in the area because the houses in the area should be costing between one to three million dollars. 
Apartments are also excellent as a vehicle, providing they're, they're located in the right area. Now with apartments, you should target only apartments in areas where there's a three to one ratio between the price of a house and an apartment. So for example, in Melbourne, you know, Turek median price is three million. So it's good to target apartments where the average value of an apartment is 672,000 because it's 346% difference. You know, Dip and D, St Kilda West, East Melbourne, same thing. Apartments 620, houses 2.2. Q, same thing, 600 grand, 2 million. So it's three to one. Glen Iris, 500,000, 1.6. So one apartment is worth three house, sorry, three apartments are worth um, one house. Where apartments don't work in Melbourne are places like Mitcham. Lovely area, love Mitcham, love Marunda Highway, green, big blocks, love it. Apartments don't work in Mitcham, they'll never work in Mitcham. Why? Houses are 750, apartments are 650. Think about it, what's wrong with that picture? Why would you buy an apartment and we can buy a house? You know, why would you rent an apartment and we can rent a house? It doesn't make sense. Yet people buy apartments in Mitcham and they sit on them for five years and they think, oh, it hasn't gone up in value. I wonder why. Because it doesn't fit the criteria. So remember, if you're going to take one thing away from this webinar, take this away. Never buy an apartment unless there's a three to one ratio between the house and the apartment area. I've just saved you 10 years of pain and I've told you something that only 0.01% of investors out there understand. House and land, don't like it, stay away from it. Okay, why? Endless supply and targeting the wrong part of the market, targeting low income earners. Unless it's house and land in, in an affluent area, but I'm talking about fringe suburbs, they don't work. Will you lose money? No, you won't lose money. I'm sure people on the webinar say, well, I bought a house in so and so suburb in the last 10 years. It went up, you know, it doubled. Yes, but areas have quadrupled in Melbourne. Williamstown quadrupled in the last 10 years. Yarraville quadrupled in the last 10 years. So it's not so much about where you lose money in some areas, it's about maximizing everything. Remember, always ask yourself as an investor, when next time you're borrowing 500,000, 600,000, you've got to ask yourself, is this the best use of my money for the next 10 years. If you're buying property and you're parking that money in the property, is that the best capital growth that I can get as an investor for the next 10 years? Because yeah, you can't lose money in, in Dandenong with a house if you bought it 12 years ago, you would have doubled your money. Big deal, you could have bought Yarraville and you could have quadrupled your money, so you lost $500,000. And that's the thing, and people say, well, I didn't know. Well, the information was out there. It was RP data and Heron told White had been on for a long time. And that's the key thing. When you're an investor, live where everyone live, but when you're investing, it's got to be completely detached, unemotional, pure numbers. That's the key to succeeding. You remember, the plan and the property selection methodology have to be based on numbers and money. There's no emotion. You know, there's no emotion when it comes to making money. So once again, that's one of the best things that I've learned over the years is all my apartments are in areas where there's a three to one ratio between house and apartment. Let's talk about the three projects that I've just sourced because I'm so excited about this. It, um, it takes me a long time to source projects and the developers that I work with are very, are developers that tend to produce one project every 12 months, you know, so they're small developers, um, they've been around for, a lot of these developers have been developing for 30 years, but they do one project at a time very carefully, very boutique. So I'm going to show you and the, and some of these projects no one has ever seen. So you're the first group to actually see them, which is really cool. First one is in Brighton in 98 Aisling Street. And this is an off-market project. Off-market meaning this project will never be advertised in realestate.com. And I'll sell this whole project to my clients before it's even released to the public. In fact, the public will never hear about it. Um, this project consists of, it's an apartment development. Now Aisling Street is located in, in Brighton. Um, you know, it's Brighton is the second most expensive suburb in Melbourne. It's on the Bayside area. Um, it's got everything. It's it's one of the aspirational suburbs, I guess, in the area. Interesting enough, Elwood's becoming more expensive than Brighton now. Uh, you know, per square meter. But um, Brighton is still in the area. It's one of the old rich suburbs. You know, um, this this is technically kind of Gardendale, Brighton, but it's actually Brighton on on the actual um, contract of sale. Brighton is 10 k's from the city in the south. It's the second most expensive suburb in Melbourne. This is an off the plan 
apartment development, which consists of seven apartments only, with a two-year settlement in a high growth area. Um, it's, a, it's a very good area to invest in for high capital growth because it has a restriction of stock that's coming on the market and it's always got people fighting over properties in the area. Rental yield at settlement will be around 4.5%. So if you're getting funding at 4%, you know it's cash flow positive, which is amazing. This developer is one of the best developers that I've worked with. He does an extremely sexy um, product. So you've got a three level development in a, in a street that's virtually all houses. So it's not in the main road, it's in a little leafy street next to houses on either side. It's the only apartment development um, in the area and in fact the council's not allowing any more apartments to be built in suburban streets. The only apartments you're going to see in Brighton are on the main roads, Bay Street, Dandy Street, Church Street. So the zoning is changing in Brighton and the council doesn't want to allow any more of these being built. Great news for investors. This development is so it's seven apartments. It's going to be completed to a very high level. This is another project that the developer has completed. The, the actual photos from another development is going to be very closely um, completed on, on very similar specs. So we're targeting, you know, the upper end here. We're targeting a market that's that's the Brighton market. You know, these are wealthy people. Who's going to be living there? Either people that have lived in Brighton in a house and downsizing to a two-bedroom apartment or kids of rich people that want to just stay in the area. Um, it's going to be amazing. It's probably one of the best projects that I've that I've sourced, um, you know, and it's a two-year build. So you're getting a lot of capital growth during the build. Um, this is what it looks like. So it's three levels and it's going to be amazing views from the top floor as well. So there's basically um, seven apartments. The cheapest ones are 775. Um, the best value are actually apartment number two, three, and four because you're going to get the highest rental yield. I would say, you know, apartment number one, 90 squares at one. These are, so Brighton, just so you know, you're selling 11,000 square meter. Um, so 1 million 70 for 90 square, you're probably looking more for owner-occupied market. Um, but I think for the investor market, 775, 800, 785, really good value considering people paying those prices in St Kilda and Elwood already, you know, in South Yarra. So it's quite interesting. Um, very good project. Um, Two-year settlement, there's only seven available. If you're interested, by the way, to get more information on this project, just send me a text or email me. Um, I'll send you more information on that project. You can do your own research. This is another project that I've sourced in Mordialic, which is in Albert Street, which is 20 k's, 24 k's from the city, southeast, Melbourne's Bayside area, and it consists of 68 townhouses, two and three bedroom. It's got a really good rental yield, cash flow neutral. So if you don't know Mordialic, there it is there. It's called Casa de Mar. It's just on the right, right hand side of the screen. It's in the Bayside area and it's just literally across the road from the train line and walking distance to the main shopping strip in Mordialic, which has become the main hub now. Um, you know, very good area in terms of rental. A lot of people live in Mordialic, they catch the express train to the city, you know, and you've got Southland Shopping Centre around the corner, which is the biggest shopping centre in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, so obviously a really good location on the water, um, quite an amazing project. And these are boutique townhouses, two and three bedroom, and these townhouses are two and three level, a single garage, a double lock-up garage, depending on the on the design. And even though there's 68 of them, um, most of them will be sold to the local market. In fact, on the first day they opened this project, the developers sold half the project in one day, which is incredible. So these are off the plan as well. Um, some of them have balconies on the roof where you're going to get you know, views over the beach and we've got barbecues on top, which is quite amazing. So they're going to be f finished to a very high level. Um, so you're going to get attract a really good caliber tenant that's going to be paying a really good rental for these properties. That's what a typical um, you know, three-level property looks like. So you've got underground tandem car park, then you've got three bedrooms with a bathroom, and then you've got an open plan living area, and then you've got a terrace on top overlooking the beach. You know, So it's quite a really good design. Uh, Kokoda Property Group is a developer. They've been around for a long time, done many projects in Melbourne. They really deliver a, a stunning 
product at the end. You will never have any issues with anything. These are quite large. So if you look at the three bedroom townhouse, total area 184 square meters, which is really, really a small house, you know. Um, and then this, that's with a single garage, by the way. Um, there's different. They're all different designs, by the way. All 68 are different. Then you've got here an example, a typical two bedroom townhouse, you know, 133 square meters with a single garage. And then you've got a tandem. Uh, these are these are uh, tandem car parks, um, triple storey, and they are 167 square meters. There's still a few left. That project will sell out in the next week or two, um, and it's it's had a massive in, you know interest from the local um, from the locals. I haven't got exclusivity of, over this project. This project is is um, there's another agent that has this project. Um, but it's it's I think it's just a great project and uh, a couple of my clients are going into that project so really exciting project great location and once again you can see every townhouse is slightly different from the others which is really cool so once again the price point there is for two bedders six hundred and seventy nine thousand eight hundred and nineteen thousand for three bedders two year settlement seventy percent sold there's only a few available um, if you want to have it. If you want more information, I'll send you a brochure, price list, just email me directly. This is the third project, which I really love. This is a really cool project, completely off market. So I have exclusivity over this project. You'll never see it advertised anywhere. Um, and you, you know, never been on realestate.com or offered by any other agent. This is actually a development in Chelsea, which is 30 k's from the city. Um, same thing, two-year settlement, boutique development of six townhouses, only two and three bedroom. Um, there's Chelsea there, so if we zoom in a little bit, it's just after Edith Vale, before Bond Beach, um, so it's really well located, but this is actually around 30 metres from the water, so it's literally on, it's on the beach side of the highway, great little project, a lot of demand for these types of projects in the area, and not many of them being built. Um, a lot of the issues with building in Chelsea is that a lot of these houses now are worth 1.52 million and the blocks are small, so there isn't really big blocks there to, to redevelop and make it worthwhile for the developer. So there's only a few sites like this left in Chelsea where you can actually build and it's on the beach side of the highway so you can walk down to the beach. It's one of the best beaches in Melbourne, by the way. Brighton hasn't got a good beach. If you've been to Brighton Beach, very average, just like St Kilda, crap, you know. The best beaches in, in Melbourne, only locals know this, start from Aspendale onwards, you know, that's where the good beaches are. Um, so once again, configuration of this property is there's five two-bedroom townhouses, um, single car garage downstairs with a master bedroom and an ensuite, um, and one of them has three bedrooms, which is the front one, which is, which is the best pick out of them. Um, but the two-bedroom ones will give you a higher rental yield, interestingly enough. So it really depends on your tax situation and your income. And I'm going to do cash flow analysis on a few properties in a second, so you get to see how this all works when you do cash flow analysis. The front one is the best one. It's got three bedrooms. It's the biggest. It's got double car garage as well, where the others have a single car garage. Mind you, the front will give you a real lower rental yield than the back ones, but you've got to work out your rental yield. Um, two bedrooms are 745, three bedrooms are 845. It's funny because I had a phone call just recently from an accounting group that said, hey, Conrad, um, we've got clients looking for three bedroom townhouses in the Bayside area for 550 to 650. And I said, so am I. If you find it, you give me, <laughs> you give me a call because I'll buy them. <laughs> so any townhouse now in the Bayside, you're looking at, you know, 750. You know, no one's building anything. You know, Bentley townhouses are selling for 1.1 million, guys. You know, so when I get phone calls, oh, I want a three-bedroom townhouse for 550 in the Bayside. I said, yeah, so do I. Because, you know, that was six years ago prices. <laughs> so anything now to build, you're looking at, you know, 650, 750 just for a two or three-bedded, uh, you know, in the Bayside. Two-year settlement, off-market off release, only six available. You can email me if you want more information. Very cool projects. Now, obviously, they're very unique and they've got good things and bad things going for them. Um, one thing you've got to understand is, is your ability to conduct cash analysis will determine which ones you should be buying and targeting. So let me show you an example. This is not for sale, by the way. This is one of the apartments that my client bought in a project called Martin, in Martin Street, St Kilda. I just want to show you cash analysis on an apartment and a townhouse, okay? Um, and I want to use examples where you get to see how the mechanics work and what information you need to have 
in order to conduct cash flow analysis. And I can do this for you as well, by the way. So, so if you are not sure about, you know, um, how much is this property going to cost me a week? You know, can we afford it? All those kinds of questions. Email me or call me, and I can do a cash analysis for you. Let me show you what one looks like. This is one I did for my clients. This is a great little project. Forty-eight apartments in St Kilda, walking distance to everywhere. Um, this is the apartment, apartment 2.10, 76 square meters. Really good configuration, by the way. By the way, this is not available. This is my client bought this property. Two bedroom, two bathrooms. Um, very good living area, 76 square meters plus a 10 meters balcony, so 86 square meters. Great little apartment. First thing you need to do is get a valuation <laughs> when you're buying something. How do you know which was 700,000? Um, so you've got a valuation here from Chartica Kramer saying it's 700,000. Great. So you need an independent valuation. Number two, you need to know um, obviously the rental, the size of the apartment. Never buy apartments that have an internal area of less than 50 square meters. So you can see their apartment 2.2 was internally 49 square meters and 2.147, never buy apartments that are less than 50 square meters because of lending restrictions. You, you, the maximum um, that you'll be able to borrow will be 80%. You're going to have problems refinancing that property and getting the next one. So remember when you're buying a property, whether it's an apartment or a townhouse, it's not just about that purchase, it's about the next purchase. It's like playing chess. You always have to think two or three steps ahead to win the game. So whenever you're buying apartments, always make sure the internal living area, more than 50 square meters, 51 square meters. You know? So this, this instance, obviously, 76 square meters, no problems. Weekly rent. Um, then you've got the owner's corporation, uh, owner's corp, two, two grand a year. And that covers you for insurance on the building. You know, when you've got apartments, you've got lifts, you've got air conditioning units, they kind of have a lifespan of probably 10, 15, 20, 30 years. They've got to be maintained, So, and you've got to ensure the building and the common areas. That's what your owner's corporation covers. Then you've got to have um, council rates. In this example, um, on $700,000, you're paying around $1,345.58 per year on council rates. But then you get to claim depreciation. In this example, in the first 12 months, you get to claim $21,000 in depreciation on building and fixtures and fittings, which is incredible. Um, also, stamp duty. The advantage of buying off the plan is that your stamp duty savings. So in this example, and this is one of the most important things when you look at apartments, why am I such a big fan of, of off the plan purchases in Victoria? Because in Victoria is one of the few states where you get to split your contract. And if you're buying an off-the-plan property, you only pay stamp duty on the land. In this case, the land's only $200,358. So your stamp duty is only $7,091. If this apartment was completed, meaning it's worth $700,000, your stamp duty would be $36,000, which hurts. That's a, that's a deposit for a property. So you're saving yourself $29,979 in stamp duty just buying off the plan. It only takes 12 months to build. You know, No big deal. So you've got a two-bedroom apartment, um, two-bathroom, car park and storage, 76 square meters internal, 10 square meter balcony, good size, 86 square meters, 700,000 off the plan, stamp duty, rental yield 5.7 a week, depreciation. Let's crunch some numbers now. Let's take a hypothetical example, Bill and Mary Smith, because obviously I don't know your situation, you're listening to this webinar right now. Um, Bill's on 85, Mary's on 50. They've got a good credit file. They've got a house with equity, so whenever you're doing cash flow analysis, even though you're putting a deposit in, work out your cash flow analysis on 100% of the purchase price plus stamp duty. Because remember, there's an opportunity cost of putting that money into a bank having, and, and getting an interest on that money. So you've just got to be working out everything on, you know, on based on like you're borrowing 100%. So in this example, you've got the purchase property, 700,000. Costs of associated with purchasing the property, $8,291. The current income, Bill's 85 grand, he's paying $21,097 in income tax for the year. The rent is five seven year week. So what happens to the rental? It gets added to your income, which is $29,334, which ends up $114,344. Now, before you pay tax, before Bill pays tax, I should say, he gets to claim his deductions. And the deductions are whopping $61,580 in the first 12 months 
which brings his income, his taxable income down to $52,762. The new tax that he's paying is only $9,542. So this is the cool thing about property. New taxable income is $52,764. Remember the original income was 85 grand. New tax payable, $9,542. So you're saving yourself 11,555 in tax that's going away from the ATO now into his back pocket or $216.85 a week. So this is the breakdown of the deductions. So how do you get these 61 grand in deductions? It's interest repayments for the loan, $32,219. Depreciation on the building, depreciation on fixtures and fittings. And expenses, landlord insurance, you know, you've got property management fees, 7.7%. You've got all different knickknacks that you, that you need to pay for. That's the $61,580. The weekly costs on that property, $619.59. Rates and maintenance, $166.82. So this property actually costs you out of pocket $786.41 to hold on to. But you've got obviously the expense is $786.41. Then you've got the rental. Plus, minus the tax, you're out of pocket 44 cents a week. Have a think about that for a second. If you want to buy a $700,000 apartment today with an average rental yield of 4.25% in the blue chip area of Melbourne, so St Kilda, Elwood, Elston Week, South Yarra, if you structure it correctly, you'd be out of pocket 44 cents per week, $1 a week is what you're out of pocket. Because you know your, your cost of funding now is 4.25%, your rental yield is 4.25%. The shortfall is virtually nothing. Plus you get all the tax, you know, as a kickback, which is incredible. So think about this, why aren't you buying these apartments? <laughs> and here's the reason why you invest in the first place. It's never the tax benefits. You know, people talk about tax, they get all excited. Tax is the icing on the cake. This is the reason why you buy this property. You know, look at the amount of cash flow, you know, it's that's it's costing you nothing virtually. But this is the reason you buy this property. In year three, you've got $165,000 based on 8% growth per year. What do you do in year three? Refinance the property, get the equity, and go again. And then you wait, and what do you do in year five? You've got 312000 less than one sixty-five. You've got another one hundred sixty-five grand. Refinance the property and get another one. And in year five, not only you, you buy another property using this property, you buy another property using the property you bought in year three as well. And this is how you build a large property portfolio, by leapfrogging from one property to another, buying properties in growth areas, refinancing, getting equity out and going again. And this is the cool thing, in the first year, the tenant pays 72% of holding costs, the taxman pays 28%, you, you don't pay anything. You're completely out of the equation. You're paying, you know, 44 cents a week. It doesn't even show up on the software. <laughs> you know, you're paying nothing over 10 years. <laughs> your tenant pays 84 percent of the holding costs, and the tax man is 16 percent. And this is what the rich have known for decades: how to build wealth using other people's money, leveraging other people's money, and buying growth assets that accumulate in value, and then you sell those assets. Let me show you an example with a townhouse. This is a property in Aspendale, in a, in a development that I still have, um, but this one is sold. So I'm showing you cash analysis on properties that are sold, that are not available, okay, just for the purpose of educating you. This is one at the rear, um, which is a three-bedroom townhouse in Aspendale, really good size, 183 square metres, double lock-up garage, open for living area. Notice the bedroom upstairs is a built-in robe and an ensuite. You always make sure that one of the master bedrooms has to be large, you know, because Ultimately, this will be probably not for a family with kids. This will be for a young professional couple. You know, um, this property is seven hundred and forty thousand. Um, I still have the other three available, by the way, in this project. Um, you've got an independent rental appraisal of six hundred dollars a week. Owners' corporation eleven $1 hundred a week. Council rates eleven $1 hundred a week. Depreciation on the property. 13,000, you notice that it's much lower than the apartment. You see the disadvantage of buying townhouses is you get lower depreciation. You see with apartments, you get to claim depreciation on the building, on your apartment, and you get a percentage of the common areas, especially when they've got underground car parks. So you get a portion of the lifts, 
the common areas, if there's any swimming pools, car park, you know, car parks, storage cages, all that gets also done. With the, with townhouses, there's virtually very little common area. There's, there could be a driveway. So you don't get any common areas. So you only get your building, Division 43, 2.5% over 40 years, and your plant and equipment. So you get $13,000. Um, land, once again, stamp duty off the plan, 10 grand, 10,430. If you buy this property, if it was completed, your stamp duty would be $38,670, which, which is painful to pay you that much in stamp duty. Um, so once again, let's crunch some numbers. You know, you've got a three bedroom, 2.5 bathroom, two car garage, great little townhouse, you know, walking distance to the beach. 183 square meters. 740 off the plan, 740 val. Stamp duty is 10,430. Weekly rental 4.17%, which is average for the area. Depreciation is $13,301 diminishing value. Bill and Mary Smith, once again, same scenario. We're borrowing 100% of the cost. So we're borrowing 95 plus, plus LV, LVR plus LMI, plus they're putting in 7% of equity from their house. So, it's, it's, so they're covering all the costs, basically. In this example, you've got a purchase price of 740. Purchase cost twelve thousand four hundred and thirty. Current income is eighty five grand. Bills income rent per week six hundred. So your rent per year is thirty thousand five seventy six. Um, total income one hundred fifteen thousand five seventy six. Less deduction sixty four thousand two hundred eighteen dollars. New taxable income goes down to fifty one thousand three hundred fifty eight dollars. New tax nine thousand thirty six dollars. Have a look at the old tax twenty one thousand ninety seven dollars. In this example, on the old tax, on the old income, I should say, Bill was getting paid $85,000. He was paying $21,097 in tax. New taxable income diminishes on paper only. Remember, this is not real income that drops down. Okay, diminishes to $51,358. New tax payable, $9,036. So new tax saving, twelve grand and sixty-one dollars or divided by 52, $231.94 a week. Your deductions are interest on the property, $38,024. Depreciation on the build, fixtures and fittings. Expenses associated with holding the property for the whole year. These are very accurate figures. Loan costs, 64218 Weekly costs, $884.19. Minus your rent, minus tax, your out of pocket, $52.25. So the thing about it is, can you afford 50 bucks a week? You know, and that's a real question because some people on 85 grand, if you've got a couple of kids and you've got a lot of commitments, this won't be too much money for you to spend. So one of the things that I do is work out what, how much realistically can you afford to spend per week. For some of you, 50 bucks a week is a lot of money. For some of you, it's nothing, you know. But this is where you've got to match the property towards your spending. And what I like to do with my clients, ideally, is get them into a property without affecting their lifestyle. So buy the best possible property in the highest growth area, but let the property cost them 10 bucks a week or five bucks a week. You know, cost them nothing. So you virtually just buy the property, settle, you still get really good capital growth, good tenants, good area, but you don't even feeling it. So I want you to have an experience where you just sell the thing and go, is that it? Oh, that's nothing. Oh, can we do it again? <laughs> Which is what my clients do. So if you buy, this is why, you know, buying an old house somewhere on, on 800 square meters, you're going to be spending 250 bucks a week. You've got no depreciation on the building. You know, it's an old property, maintenance issues. And this is why most investors only have one investment property. Because they buy an old house on a big block and suddenly they're spending 250 bucks a week maintaining this thing and they go, I, don't, I can't afford another one. But if you're buying properties where it's not costing you anything, it's not affecting your lifestyle and you've got no headaches, no maintenance costs, it's brand new, maximum depreciation. It's just a question of how many can you buy and how quickly. And that's the main difference. It's not about getting one best property, guys. It's about creating a systemized approach to accumulation. That's the difference that's going to make you wealthy versus just buying one house in the best area. And here's the reason you invest in the property in the first place. You look at the capital growth history, you know, of an area like this, 8% growth. Year three, refinance the townhouse, get a, you got 170,000, what would you do in year three? Go again. You buy another townhouse, what would you do in year five? Go again, buy another townhouse. Have a look at the, the, the shortfall, you know, you've probably got about 20 grand there in, in terms of um, 
give or take in terms of negative shortfall. It becomes cash flow positive around year ten, but who cares? You know, like it's not about it's not about the cash flow from the rental guys. It's about the capital growth you get on this property. Remember, in year five you can sell this property. You got three hundred grand in capital growth. Who cares about the rental? You know, the rental's nothing. It's never about the rental. It, the rental's just there to help you hold on to the property. It's all about the capital growth, and capital growth happens in areas where there's scarcity and household incomes with a lot of money. Now, in this property, Bill has to contribute, you know, some money. So probably for him, I wouldn't recommend this property. I'll probably buy something a little bit cheaper, you know, with a higher rental yield. Um, it's still pretty good though, 50 bucks a week, as long as you can you can save that, or have a house with equity. You can take it out of your equity. You need to pay for it, out, you know, out of your pocket. Your tenant pays, you know, 67%. You pay 7%, um, and your taxman pays. 26%. So you are contributing a little bit before it becomes cash flow, you know, neutral eventually in year, year 9 and 10, which is pretty cool. The average property in Melbourne becomes cash flow positive in year 11 and 12 before it becomes cash flow positive, just by just leaving it there without doing anything to it. So what's the next step? Buy my book. Okay, it's all in there. <laughs> For 30 bucks, it's the best money you can spend. If you don't like it, after you read it, Send it back to me. I'll give you 30 bucks back. Okay, number one. <laughs> um, number two, I hope you enjoyed this webinar and I hope it gave you a little bit of insight onto due diligence and cash analysis. If you like this information, I'm running a two-day event in Melbourne uh, in October called the Real Estate Fast Track Weekend. And if you go to the website, Real Estate Fast, State Fast Track, um, the tickets are free and it's a two-day event with myself and uh, Stephen McClutchy, he's the Director of Loans Australia. Stephen has settled over $900 million of loans and Cameron Fisher from Changing Places Real Estate. Cameron's a valuer, he's the Director of Changing Places Real Estate. He's been in real estate for 30 years, he's done 5,000 auctions. So the three of us are going to educate you over, th over two days. Um, it's an amazing event because it's, I've cut up the event into two parts. Day one is in the classroom environment. And it's all about finance and property portfolio structuring. I'll show you how to pay off your house in record time. Where if you've got a 30-year principal and interest mortgage, I'll show you how to smash it, you know, in seven to ten years, maybe fifteen years, depending on the situation. The net result is you'll save yourself tens of thousands of dollars in unnecessary interest repayments. Also, so the first day is all about psychology, finance, due diligence, research, how to build, structure, and automate this massive property portfolio. Very technical day. It's nine o'clock to six p.m. People do get headaches. It's a lot of content. So that's day one. Day two, we take you out of the classroom environment. We put you on the bus and we actually show you five or six projects. And we drive through Melbourne and we do on the ground due diligence and research. And we actually go to different suburbs and we critique suburbs. We critique projects um, because I think the missing link between people actually taking action is going out there with real estate, it's like myself, and actually looking at projects, looking at different suburbs, and getting that really, you know, in the trenches, on the ground experience that you cannot get out of reading books and listening to webinars and going to seminars. You've got to get out there and actually do due diligence on the ground. So day two, we actually go through a lot of suburbs in Melbourne. We educate you about different areas, what good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, you get to network with like-minded individuals. These workshops are very small and intimate. There are only 40 people per workshop. I've just released this the other day and there's 30 seats left. There's 10 people already booked in. They do book out, by the way. You can upgrade to VIP tickets for $97 or you can have general tickets for free. Um, and there's only 40 per event. I don't allow more than 40 people, mainly because on day two the bus is only a 50-seater. And plus staff, it's pretty much the full bus. You know, So this is um, the, the, the event is on the 24th and 5th of October. It's the last event I'm running for the year. So if you're serious about building wealth, if you want to take your knowledge to the next level, um, I highly recommend that you do whatever it takes to get to this event because I think the information there that you're going to learn is is amazing. I hold nothing back, and I, you know it's taken me 20 years to learn this stuff, and and I've spent thousands of dollars on on personal development, and not only that, I've read well over 150 books on real estate, but and psychology and finance. But I've been a real estate agent and a and a banker and a mortgage broker and an investor, and I've invested through two property cycles. So I'm teaching you everything 
you know, that I that I have in those two days. I think it's priceless, you know, but I'm giving away for free. Um, I do this, you know, randomly. Uh, you know, I run these every kind of six, seven weeks per year, you know, per year. And uh, people love them. Check out the website. There's testimonials there. You can you can check it out. Check out the um, the dates as well. Um, my book also on book on finance and on Amazon. I'm also going to send you guys a webinar recording so you can go through the information in more detail. So you will get an email if you're on this webinar with a recording of the whole webinar, so you can watch it over and over and over. Um, and because I know that I go into a little bit of technicalities and some of you are different levels of your game, some of you are seasoned investors, but some of you are just starting out as well. So some of the information I'll be covering might be, you know, a little bit overwhelming, which is cool. That's about it for me tonight. I'm about to take questions, but for now, I really want to thank you guys for tuning into this webinar. And in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be running a really cool webinar on five ways you can buy property with no money down which is really cool. And I'm gonna showcase actual properties that I've purchased myself that my clients are buying with no money down and how they're structuring the transactions, which is really cool. For now, I wanna thank you guys for spending this evening with me and I'm about to open up and take questions about anything that was covered during the webinar. For those who are tuning in, thank you very much.